is this this man who is pummeling this other Never met the man in my entire life. Well, you're an all-state champion. How do you stay in shape these days? I like to cook Italian. Well, how can that I, be healthy um, for you? Well, let me get this through your head in a very gentle way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome all those listening into this program in order to learn to walk according to the will of God and live in his will. On this 18th day of the month of March in the year of our Lord, 2023, it's very cold up here in northern Michigan. <laughs> We had a little bit of a storm yesterday, a snowstorm. I was driving up from down south in southern Michigan in the lower peninsula where I was filling in for a priest for a couple of days who was giving a retreat to uh, a community of nuns in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I had a four-hour drive back here in the snowstorm yesterday, and today it's not snowing, but the snow's on the ground, and it reminds me of the frigidity that of sometimes, unfortunately, we give to the Lord in exchange for the glorious love and mercy he extends to us as we prepare for the Feast of Divine Mercy after the Feast of Easter. Sometimes when we experience during Lent our own infirmities, our own weakness, our own shortcomings, we are given an occasion by our Lord to get better to return with a firm resolution and to decide to live always, only, exclusively for him, which of course includes our neighbor. You know, yesterday's reading of the gospel was of the Shema, S-C-H-E-M-A, from Matthew. Um, actually, it was from Mark yesterday, yeah, from Mark, where Jesus says, he also says it in Matthew, in response to a Pharisee who asked him which of all the laws of the Old Testament is the greatest. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, thou shalt love with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. So when we love the divine will exclusively, it necessarily includes our neighbor. John also reminds us in his letter and in his gospel that the love of God is proved by our love of neighbor. Of course, I'm paraphrasing. He says it more like, he who says he loves God but does not love his neighbor is a liar. So if you put together the vertical approach to holiness, which is the love of God and him alone, along with the horizontal love of neighbor, what do you have but a cross? And it is only by means of the cross that we celebrate every Friday during the stations in Lent, that we attain the light. And there's the old Latin expression, ad lucem per crucem, to the light through the cross. Today I wish to explore a little bit about the liturgy because Louisa grew up in a time when the liturgy that she participated in, along with Saint Padre Pio, her compatriot and her contemporary, and as many other saints, before and after her, um, was of the extraordinary form. I mentioned in one of the previous podcasts that I was filling in at a parish in southern Michigan about a month ago for about three and a half weeks for a priest who was studying for his doctorate in Rome. And there they 
I celebrated the extraordinary form in Latin several times a week, both low and high form, as well as the ordinary form in English. So I wanted to touch upon the liturgy because it not only did it impact the life of Louisa and her writings and her grammar, but her spirituality, her education. And it also, in, in addressing this theme, it touches upon the recent decision of Pope Francis to have the Congregation for Divine Worship um, grant dispensations to those churches, those oratories, those chapels, where the Latin Mass may be celebrated. So it's a current event, as well as a Louisian and spiritual event, we may say. Okay, well, let's start with Louisa in Latin. Louisa, she presents a catechesis, right, of the gift of living in the divine will and the grace associated with it in three progressive stages, as we all know. She calls these progressive stages fiats, the fiat of creation of God the Father, the fiat of redemption of God the Son, and the fiat of sanctification of the Holy Spirit. Now, the word fiat is a Latin word revealed by Jesus to Louisa in a time when the church's liturgy was universally celebrated in Latin. And it signifies God's one operation that creates, redeems, sanctifies, and the human being's cooperation with the divine will for the sake of glorifying God on behalf of all creatures. Now, Louisa's frequent use of the term fiat, as well as other Latin expressions, for example, abintra operatio, which means God's internal operation that is peculiar to the three divine persons in eternity. Or ab eterno, that's God's existence from eternity and his knowledge from eternity. And other expressions, ad extra operatio, that is his creation in the material order. And others occurred during the time in which the liturgy was celebrated in liturgical Latin. Why does God use Latin with Louisa who did not speak Latin? Because it exemplifies Christ's intimate rapport with his mystical body, the church. Christ always reveals himself through the optic and the language of the church, always. So if God appears to a Catholic woman, he will speak in the Catholic liturgical expressions. If he appears to an Orthodox woman, he will speak in those Orthodox liturgical expressions, and so on. God adapts himself to the language of the recipient, and this is evident in the apparitions of Mary to Saint Bernadette of Subirou. Mary spoke in a poor, impoverished, imperfect French dialect, because that's what Bernadette spoke in. Mary did not come as a scholar and speak in perfect French, nor did Jesus to Louisa, but spoke to her in Italian dialect, because that's what she spoke. Now, today, the Pope in recent times, 2021, 2023, put out two letters on the Latin Mass. Now, the Latin Mass influenced scores of saints. Some people say the Latin Mass made many saints. I won't go so far as to say that. I will say any Mass made many saints. It doesn't have to be Latin, because the Mass, regardless of the language, is always the unbloodied representation of Christ on Calvary. Whether it's Spanish, Swahili, Polish, Irish, Italian, Latin, it doesn't matter. Still, the unbloodied, full, efficacious effusion of Christ's blood in atonement for sin that enables us to inherit eternal life. Did not Jesus say in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 53, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life. Now, one of the things about the Latin Mass that is, how would I say, not imperfect, but not complete, maybe, 
is there is no, no distribution of the blood. Now, I love the Latin Mass, don't get me wrong. It has many pros, but there are some things that are incomplete in the Latin Mass. And the same goes for the English, the Novus Ordo or the ordinary form. Even though it has the option of the blood, there are things it doesn't have that the Latin has. So I will touch upon that in a moment. But of course, I'm not diminishing either the doctrine of concomitance, which teaches that whether you drink his body or blood, either species contains the whole Christ. And yet, the Second Vatican Council document, as well as Pope John Paul II, in his encyclical Ecclesia de Eucharistia, states that both the body and blood bring us to a greater sign of participation in the banquet of Christ. And St. Paul says in his first letter to the Corinthians 11.28, let a man examine himself so as to eat the bread and drink the cup. In any event, Louisa and many other saints were formed by this beautiful language of Latin. Now it's not used anymore today as a colloquial language. It's pretty much dead. Very few people speak Latin, but it's very much alive in the church's publications. The official language of the Catholic Church is Latin. When it publishes documents, when it publishes motu you know, motu propios, encyclicals, apostolic exhortations, bulls, etc., always in Latin. And you know, for the Gabriel Amor, the late exorcist of Rome, was not hesitant to tell people that Satan hates Latin. He has a lot of memories of saints that were formed in Latin that really did damage to his kingdom, including St. Padre Pio, who celebrated the Mass in Latin, Faustina Cavasco participated therein, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, and all these great saints, Luisa Picaretta, right? So Pope Francis recently put out a um, letter and I believe this came in February of this year. I think it was um, Tradiciones Custodes. I think it was in July. And was it? I don't know. The first one came out in July 2021. Then another one came out in February of this year. In which he established new circumstances for celebration of the 1962 Roman Missal in Latin and requested that bishops designate one or more locations for the celebration of the Latin Mass, but stipulated that those locations are not to be in parish churches. They can be in oratories, they can be in um, chapels, and that if they should be in parishes, this came out more recent in February, that they write to the congregation in Rome for a dispensation. Okay? Now, some people are taken aback by this, as if the Pope is trying to reverse what Pope, the late Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, issued in, nine, in 2007, in July 2007, in his um, Sumorum Pontificium Apostolic Letter, which granted freedom to priests to use the Tridentine liturgy in its 1962 form, stating that all priests of the Latin Church may freely celebrate Mass with this 1962 missile privately. They may freely do it privately. He also, Pope Benedict stated that in parishes where a group of the faithful attached to this Latin rite stably exists, the parish priest should willingly accede to their request to celebrate the Holy Mass according to the rite of the 1962 Roman Missal. And that the priest should ensure that the good of these members of the faithful is harmonized, that's key, with the ordinary pastoral care of the parish under the governance of the bishop. So even Pope Benedict, when he allowed the priest the freedom to celebrate this mass privately at any time, and where there's need among the parishioners in public, to always do so under the governance of the bishop. Okay? So Pope Francis, when he's asking that the bishops write the Vatican, he's doing this according to what I read him say in his own quoted, quoted statements. For, by the way, whenever you hear people say the Pope said this, don't listen to them unless you see his words in quotation marks. I always tell people this. 
because the media, even Catholic bloggers, claiming they're defending the church while attacking the Pope, take the Pope's words out of context. And I'll talk, touch upon that if I don't forget, giving you an example of Pachamama that caused a big scandal in the Amazon, but really there was no scandal. And I'll explain that. I hope I don't forget before I make this point on Pope Francis's uh, request that the bishops write the Holy See, in particular the Dicastery for the Congregation of Divine Worship, requesting for the Latin, Latin Mass to be celebrated in a given parish, okay? Now, one notable occasion I remember is the Steubenville um, recent statement of the bishop. People were putting out articles in magazines, even on online Catholic websites, saying, oh, Steubenville has been prohibited from saying the Latin Mass on its campus. The Latin Mass stop. This, don't listen. <laughs> people give you half-truths whenever you read these things. Don't listen to these people. Half of it's true, half of it's false. The Latin Mass did not stop in Steubenville. That is not true. It's been removed from the campus one mile to another parish. So it's not stopped. And people are claiming, oh, it's been stopped. They don't know what they're talking about. And this is where the confusion happens and unnecessary bashing of the Pope takes place. People don't understand the context or the full story. The Latin Mass is still offered weekly in Steubenville at St. Peter's Church, which is a parish church about a mile from the campus. And the parish offers the Latin Mass weekly, which includes a high mass about once a month on the first Sunday. So the Vatican order only appeals to put restrictions on the Latin Mass offered in parish churches and does not appear to force bishops to restrict the Latin Mass at all. So this chapel used by the students at the Franciscan University is for the Latin Mass. Today, it's still going on, St. Peter's, okay? And the university provides shuttles to St. Peter's Church once a month for students who wish to attend. So you know, people don't get their story straight and they take unnecessary lengths to create confusion because I suppose they don't have anything better to do. So they need prayer, these people that think they're defending the church and then while attacking it at the same time, they need prayer, okay? Now, Louisa and St. Padre Pio and all these other great saints, St. Maximilian Kolbe, Pasadena Belanger, Martha Robin, um, St. Elizabeth of the Holy Trinity, Venerable Concepcion Cabrera de Armida, they all were formed by the Latin Mass. And not just the Latin Mass, but the theology that comes from the Latin documents issued by the Vatican. I will touch upon that in a moment. But first, let us go to Latin. Why so much importance? upon Latin. Let's go back to the very beginnings of Christianity. Jesus and his disciples did not speak Latin. Let me get this straight. Okay. <laughs> For those of you listening, Latin did not exist among the apostles of Christ. The church was not founded upon Latin. It was founded upon Greek. Jesus spoke Aramaic, a language close to Hebrew, and the evangelists wrote in a poor colloquial like street Greek called Koine of the Mediterranean at the time. And the first language of Christian liturgy was Aramaic. It was not Latin. So if you really want to be traditional, go all the way back to the Aramaic. Don't do the Latin. Go to the Aramaic. <laughs> so what we're talking about here is a progression of development of liturgical reform. So Latin came in like 1600 years after Christ as the official liturgy of the Western scholastic era, if you want to call it that, even though scholasticism began earlier around the 12th century. So we may call it a neo-scholastic era. Nonetheless, Aramaic was the first Christian liturgy in the common language of the first Christians who were Palestinian Jews. Hebrew was the language of scripture, formal worship at the time of Christ. Christian worship occurred in the home where Aramaic was spoken. So Christianity quickly spread from Palestine to the rest of the world and the Eucharist became celebrated in many languages, including Syriac, Coptic, and Armenian. These were the first outcroppings of the what we have today, the ordinary form of the English Mass or the extraordinary form of the Latin Mass. Started with Aramaic, spread into Syriac, then Coptic, and Armenian. And most of the Mediterranean world 
at the time of Christ, spoke Greek, okay? And this became the language of the liturgy. Let me emphasize this. The colloquial language spoken by the people became the language of the liturgy at the time of Christ. You see where I'm going with this? That same thing applies today. This is why Pope Paul VI, who is now a saint, wanted the Latin language that nobody was speaking anymore, colloquially, to be adapted to the language people speak, because that's exactly what Christ did. That's what the apostles did. They celebrated in the language that they spoke. But this does not diminish the beauty of the Latin Mass. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to give you the reason behind the language of the Mass we participate in today, which is the Vulgan vernacular, or the Vulgate, you may call it. It comes from the St. Jerome's translation of the Bible. The readings are read from the Latin Vulgate. But the approach to the Mass was very simple. And the common language was Greek and became the liturgy. From around the third century, Latin was in three different tiers. It was a classical Latin, it was a classical written Latin, and an ordinary colloquial Latin. So the classical spoken Latin was the common spoken language on the street. Then there was the um, orat oratorical Latin that was written by the scholars, the great poets like Cicero, Caesar, Virgil, Tacitus. They wrote iconic pieces of literature which almost cemented their stylus of literature language moving away from the vulgar street language to the classical Latin. And um, around the 14th century, the time of the Black Plague, the worst pandemic in human history that killed almost 50, 50, 50 percent of the European population, the cause of which we don't know today. But coincidentally, it occurred in the same century in which exorcisms stopped being performed in the church. That's right. The same century in which the church stopped performing exorcisms is when the Black Plague hit Europe. So when the devil is not cast out by exorcisms, people become demonized and are killed. And the exorcisms were replaced by the Inquisition, witch burnings, and Joan of Arc is a prime example. They never exercised her to determine the veracity of her revelations, but they turtled the common practice of her day. They burned her at the stake. False substitute of casting out evil did not do the job. And nonetheless, around that time, the fourth century, um, a lot of these scholars died during the Black Plague. These great iconic poets and this had a negative ripple effect on the entire education system and on Latin, on classical Latin. But after this Black Plague, there was a birth of the Renaissance that spread throughout Italy, France, and even Britain, where more people started reading Latin literature from classical authors. And from this point up until the 19th century, it was a requirement for all who attended college, that is, people of education, to learn language the language of Latin, but also Greek. See, in the Western world, we are deficient in Eastern spirituality. We don't know Greek, and we should. How many of you went to the school and were taught the church fathers? None of you, very few of you. And the church fathers were Greek writers, and they provided the foundation of our spirituality that would impact the writings of Louisa. In my doctoral dissertation, I express how the Greek patristic doctrine heavily, heavily influenced Louisa's writings. Jesus speaks about divinization many times. This new stage that follows spiritual marriage, he talks about purification, illumination, unification, and then this divinization, where the divine will makes the soul divine, where it performs divine acts. Now, the word divinization is only mentioned like twice in the whole Western theological field. Thomas Aquinas, I don't believe, ever uses it. Augustine maybe uses it twice. I think Aquinas uses it only once. The Greek writers use it thousands of times. 
So if you're going to try to explain the doctrines of Louisa on divinization, you see, Western scholastic theology does not cut it. It's incomplete. St. Pope John Paul II said that the East and the West are like two lungs breathing in one body. We need them both to exist. So according to Eusebius, he was an early historian, and he spoke of the life of Constantine. He was told directly by Constantine that Constantine had a vision of a sign, a cross-shaped trophy formed from light like a, a T, above the sun at midday. And Lactantius, another historian around the time of 313, mentions that Constantine's dream took place on the eve of the climactic battle of the Milvian Bridge, Pons Milvius, which is right in Rome by the Tiber. I've walked across that a few times, which was a great victory because with this victory, Constantine issued an edict that it was proper that the Christians and all others should have the liberty to follow their own religion. So Constantine in the fourth century gave Christianity its freedom and its promulgation. Then in 380, there was an edict of Thessalonica. Now, Theodosius the Great was a Roman emperor from 379, I think, to 395. But during his reign, he succeeded in a big war against the Goths. Now, the Goths were Germans, you know, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, and this is why Venice, by the way, was created. Because of the barbarian invasion, the Italians fled. So they built a place on the island so it would be difficult to reach them. That's how Venice was created, fleeing from the Goths. And um, two civil wars were under this reign of Theodosius. But he was important because he made Christianity the religion of the land. He cemented in all of Europe Christianity as the religion of the, of the empire. And he was instrumental in establishing the Creed of Nicaea as the orthodox doctrine of Christianity. So Theodosius was a great Roman emperor following Constantine. And these two edicts not only cemented Christianity, but also Latin, because Latin started to emerge around that time. Now, Latin began well before Christ. It began by the Italians. Most people don't know this. Another prop for the Italians. Latin was first spoken by the Italians. And this was around 700 BC in a small settlement sloping up toward the Palatine, the Palatine Hills, which is right overlooking Circus Maximus. I lived there for 10 years with a Brazilian Byzantine Catholic monks. I would walk by Circus Maximus to go to the university there every day. And um, the speakers of this language were called Romans. And after their legendary founder, Romulus, you know, this language began to spread. And this is the foundations of the Tridentine Latin Mass, the Roman Latin language. And um, this influenced Louisa and the expressions Jesus uses in her writings that are explained quite carefully. I'll give you some examples. Jesus speaks to Louisa um, of how Jesus Christ, in his two natures, divine and human, operates in a divine and eternal manner. And this divine and eternal manner of operation is called a divine act. Okay, now let's break it down theologically in Latin, and I'll show you the importance of Latin for theology that formed many of these saints, including Louisa. Um, let me refer you to Pope Leo I's letter to Flavianum, which constitutes a dogmatic exposition on the two natures of Christ. And it was penned in response to the Christological question on the union of natures and person of Jesus. Now, it's important to note that the terms nature and person that constitute the foundation of this theandric operation of Christ that is divine human operation of Christ's divinity and humanity, known as divine acts. And it was in response to a duophysist vocabulary 
that was being used at the time of Pope Leo that confused the two natures. There was no confusion between the two. And that's why he wrote this letter to clarify how they're distinct natures. They're not one. So Jesus twofold eternal and temporal manner of operation is found in Louisa's writings. That's based upon this very letter of Flavianum. Even though Louisa didn't read it, Jesus knew it. <laughs> and Jesus shared it with Louisa. That is the contents of this distinction that Pope Leo articulates. He states, the uniqueness of each, this is Pope Leo stating, the uniqueness of each nature of Christ being preserved and combined in one person was hum humbly assumed by majesty. The mortality was assumed by eternity. An inviolable nature was joined to a possible nature. Consequently, the Son of God entered into these lowly conditions of the world after descending from his celestial throne. And though he did not withdraw from the glory of the Father, he was generated in a new order and in a new nativity, permanent before times. He began to be in time. Each nature does what is proper to it with the mutual participation of the other. Now, this is a theological, theological statement, theological language. But I emphasize this because in Latin, which he wrote, there's a distinction in terms that the English does not reveal, nor does the Italian reveal it. There emerges in Christ a reciprocal rapport of functions that combines the eternal operation, and in Latin it's operante, with the temporal operation. And the word in Latin is exequente. So operation from above, which is neither beginning nor end, which comes from the Trinity, is operante. And the finite operation of Christ's humanity is exequente. You can't get this, distinguish, this distinction without Latin. So here we have a communion that combines God's eternal operation with his temporal human acts in the divine person of Jesus Christ. That's why Latin is also the language of the church when it issues its documents, because Latin is the most refined language of theology today, and ever actually. It's more refined than French, than Italian, than Spanish, than Portuguese, than Romanian, than German, and the list goes on. All of these Mediterranean or Romance languages come from Latin. They're, der they're derivatives of Latin. Certainly English too. English is influenced heavily by German, of course, but it's also from Latin. But here I'm talking about the Latin, but remember it all started with Greek. And we are deficient as a Western civilization and a Western church in Greek spirituality. When in Rome writing this dissertation, I had to consult with the original Greek manuscripts that talk about divinization that's found all over Louisa's writings and that's not found in Latin. It's found in the translations of the Greek in Latin. That is the Greek translations into Latin but Latin in and of itself does not have much exposition on the reality of divinization. So you have to know the Greek in order to understand this. So I consulted what's called the Patrologia Greca, PG, which is an edited collection of writings by the Christian church fathers and of various secular writers in the Greek language. And it consists of 161 volumes produced in 1857 by J.P. Migne, is called Empreme Catholique. He was from Paris. And it includes both the Eastern fathers and the Western authors who wrote before Latin became the prominent language in the Western church in the third century onward. And it also had writings of the apostolic fathers, the first and second epistle of Clement, the shepherd of Hermas, Eusebius, Origen, the Cappadocian fathers like Basil, Gregory of Nazianzus, of Nazianzeno, of Nisa, and the first series contained only Latin translations of the original Greek in about 81 volumes. The second series of this Patrologia Greca, which is a patristic collection of books, contained the Greek text with a Latin translation. Now, where the Greek original has been lost in some of these texts, as in the case of, let's say, Irenaeus, St. Irenaeus of Lyons, um, 
the Latin text completes the missing parts of the Greek. And that's why Latin is important too. In one instance, the original Greek is preserved in Syriac, but later translated in Latin. In another context, there is no Greek, it's just the Latin. So you need both, East and West, to understand the very beginnings of the development of the theology of the operation of Christ in eternity and on earth. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, I wanted to get back to something. Oh, yes, the Pachimama. Some people take exception to Pope Francis' decision to take the Pachimama, pagan goddess of fertility, and bring it into the church. <laughs> Excuse me. I take no exception to this. You know why? I'll give you an example. This has been done since the time of Christ, what Pope Francis did. Let's go back to St. John the Evangelist, the longest surviving apostle who died at Patmos. He was well into his 90s. His body was never found, by the way. I went to visit his tomb, but it's empty. I never found his body, like that of Moses. And St. John is the first writer in the history of Christianity to refer to Jesus as the Logos, the Word of God. In fact, after every Latin Mass, the priest walks to the left side of the altar and he reads the sequencia secund, like the, the gospel reading from John, secundum Ioannis, secundum Ioannis. And then he says, in principiat et ad verbum, in the beginning was the word and the word was God. Where did this concept of word come from that John refers to Christ? You know where it began? In Greek pagan mythology, that's right. St. John the Evangelist took a pagan Greek word and applied it to Christ. At the time of John the Evangelist, the word logos, you know what it meant? It was like, it was like what you refer today in New Age spirituality as energy. The logos was an impersonal force in nature. It didn't have any distinct characteristics. Like Star Wars, let the force be with you. That was the logos. So what did John do? He took a pagan term and he applied it to Christ. He said, he is the Logos. The same thing Paul did when he went to the Areopagus in Athens and preached to the philosophers and sophists. He said, I see you have all these all shrines devoted to many gods, but I saw one that said the unknown God. And you know what Paul did? He said, this is Jesus Christ. He's the unknown God you've been looking for. That's exactly what Pope Francis did. He bent down to this Aborigine culture in the Amazon that don't know Christ, whose members don't know Christ. And he, brought, he took what they considered the goddess, which we call the Virgin Mary. He brought it into the church. He said, this is your Virgin Mary. And then these radical ultra-right Catholics broke into the church, stole it, and threw it in the Tiber River. Imagine that. They were defending the faith. Yeah, I don't think they were. I think they were defending their own ego. Because they don't understand the history behind the gesture of Pope Francis. Pope John Paul II created a term in the church called enculturation. He said we must enculturate the gospel. What does that mean? When the church was establishing a diocese in Africa, it had to wean from the African culture this tribalship, and yet institute the gospel and the teachings and the liturgy of Christ. How do you do that? You adapt the existing cultures, customs, while weaning them of all paganism and tribal customs that are contrary to the gospel. You allow those that are not contrary to the gospel to coexist. So if in Africa they don't use the organ, they do in some places like Johannesburg where I said mass with the Cardinal um, Bluetooth Tlagali, I think that's his last name, Tlagali. They, the, they had the organ at the top, but they also had the, the, con the drums, the, I think they call them congos, and they had dancing. They all wore gowns and they would dance. They shuffle side to side and it was beautiful, actually. 
But if you go to the Tridentine Mass, you try to do that, they'll stone you. They'll burn you to the stake. And I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong. What I'm saying is we have to understand there's not one single way of worshiping God. The church for the last two millennia have welcomed many ways in worshiping God. You know, the great, late Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen stated, and I remember this because I agree with it 100%. I'm very orthodox in my theology, but I'm very unorthodox in my spirituality. These are the exact words of Fulton Sheen. I'm orthodox in my theology, but I am very unorthodox in my spirituality. And then he went on to explain. He believed that every river should have a bed of water, but he did not like to see the same water over that bed, that bedrock at the bottom of the lake. He believed that we have to find new ways of expressing our, our doctrine, that spirituality. And this is why St. Paul in his letter to the Corinthians speaks of all these charismatic gifts that he had, speaking in tongues, praying in tongues. He said he had all the gifts, the mystical gifts, the charismatic gifts. You try to bring the crazy matics, I mean the charismatics into the Latin mass, yeah, good luck with that. But the point is every place has its own purpose and its own beauty and its own enrichment that embellishes the church. We need this diversity. God is not a God of uniformity. He's a God of unity and diversity. Let me repeat that. The Christian God is not a God of uniformity. He is a God of unity in diversity. We can all celebrate around one altar, Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants. We are all members of the one body of Christ because we're all baptized. And it is not until we get out of our head this idea that, oh, unless you're Catholic, you cannot receive confession, that we will never celebrate around one altar. The Court of Canon Law allows all the baptized, including the Protestants, to receive three sacraments provided. They do so under certain conditions. And those three sacraments are Confession, communion, and anointing of the sick. I think it's Article 866, the Code of Canon Law. But I wrote an article on this, actually. It's on my, I think it's on my website, livinginthedivinewill.org, of intercommunion. There, the church allows it under certain conditions. And as I recall, the conditions are very simple. Number one, the person who's not Catholic, but he's Orthodox or Protestant, but he's baptized, must approach the Catholic minister on his own. Number two, he must manifest the same belief in the sacraments as the Catholics do. And number three, he doesn't have recourse to these sacraments in his own church. And the same applies with Catholics and Orthodox. A Orth Catholic can go to an Orthodox communion, provided these same conditions are met. Now, you may say, well, how can a Protestant go to sacramental confession? Well, number one, they're baptized, so they are already free of original sin, and therefore they have a right. Pope John Paul II stated that. I know it's a very thorny issue, and that's why I refer you to this document I wrote on this very issue of intercommunion. There are conditions that have to be met, okay? And the Archdiocese of Rockville Center put out a beautiful work on how excuse me, this can become a reality, meeting all these conditions. And let me see if I could pull up that document now that I brought it up of Rockville Center, which is the diocese in which I was born. It's called Special Circumstances excuse me, for Admission of Other Christians to Communion at Catholic Celebrations of the Eucharist in the Diocese of Rockville Center. It was approved by, Arch, by Bishop John McGann on September 14th, 1999. And it speaks of different ways in which this can be a reality, whether it's at weddings or funerals where non-Catholics participate, at institutional settings, and so forth. And uh, I mentioned earlier about Pope John Paul II stating that the, um, the baptized having the right to receive these sacraments, excuse me. 
I'm going to try to find that expression here now that I put my foot in my mouth. I have to finish it, right? He states that Catholic ministers can administer the sacraments to Christians with whom Catholics do not share full ecclesial communion. And this comes from, um, and provided these conditions are met, um, a directory in 1996 that was reiterated, reiterated by the National Catholic Conference of Bishops. And um, he also made the statement on another occasion. And if I don't find it here, I will share with you what Pope Benedict did in St. Peter's Square. Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger on April 8th, before he was coronated pontiff, when he was prefect for the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, in St. Peter's Square, during the funeral of Pope John Paul II, days before he was Pope Benedict was made Pope, he administered communion to a Protestant in public. Cardinal Ratzinger did this. If you don't believe me, look it up. Brother Roger Schutz, who was murdered, martyred, I should say, a minister of the Swiss Reformed Church, Protestant, and founder of the Taizé community, received in public in St. Peter's Square communion from Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger on April 8th at the funeral of Pope John Paul II's mass, uh, funeral mass. Now you say, how can the Pope do this? Give communion in public to a Protestant? Because he was worthy. He was disposed. He was confessed. He believed in the Eucharist. Okay, like like Catholics do. And um, but I deviated from my point. Of course, we don't take this lightly giving communion out like, you know, it's just anything. We have to make sure the person is worthy and and they have to bear witness to God that there they are. The onus lies, uh, the responsibility lies upon them as well, not just the minister who's administering, but the person who wishes to receive it. And this applies to Catholics, by the way, too. You know, we shouldn't be worried so much about Protestants when many Catholics aren't properly disposed. So Latin plays a beautiful component in the formation of the liturgy that Louisa was formed in, of the theology that she was indoctrinated in, and in the language that she was educated in by Christ. Even Louisa studied in Italian, the Tridentine Baltimore Catechism. We call it Baltimore Catechism. We're very American. I think we're the only one who calls it a Baltimore Catechism because it was just, it was made in English in Baltimore, Maryland. But it's really the Tridentine Catechism, the Catechism of the Council of Trent. And Louisa was formed in that. That's where she got her theology from too, which was a translation in Italian from the Latin. Now, the Latin Mass, as I mentioned, is a beautiful contribution to the church for many reasons. Having celebrated high and low Masses in Latin, I can tell you that it instills piety, reverence. You just see the handling of the sacred consecrated objects, the chalice, the pyx, the paten, handled much more reverently than I see in many of the English Masses. The bows, the genuflections. And now that I'm getting older, I can't genuflect as I used to. I think the Eastern liturgy would be better on my knees than the Western. They don't genuflect, they bow. Of the minister and the altar servers, the beautiful prayers of repentance to God, like in the Confiteor, where they pray to St. Michael and Raphael and Mary, to God. The usage of um, some of the altar servers use gloves when they handle the sacred vessels. The humble reception on your knees at the communion rail. All these are beautiful signs of reverence. And the families of the Latin masses that I know, the children are so pious. They really are. And then there's the danger, as there is with everything, of creating sort of like a, a caste system where if you don't go to this mass because it's more reverent, then you are not fulfilling your Christian obligation. And that's not true. Every Mass, as I mentioned earlier, 
is always the same consecration of the body and blood of Christ. And as Bishop Sheen said, there are different ways of expressing our doctrine known as spirituality. If you want to know which is the liturgy that most resembles that of the apostles, it is the St. James liturgy. It's not the Latin liturgy. It's what today is celebrated in the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church. That liturgy most resembles the liturgy of the apostles, not the Tridentine Mass, not the English Mass, not the extraordinary Latin form, not the ordinary English form, but the Orthodox or the Eastern form. Now, of course, there are different nuances in the different Eastern forms. So there's this Armenian or Syriac or Coptic or Russian or Greek. Um, but the St. James liturgy is the one that's most faithful to that of the apostles. And um, St. John Chrysostom helped develop that liturgy too, several centuries later. But I'm grateful that I have had the education I did because with it, I was able to have faculties to celebrate mass in three rites, the Byzantine Eastern rite, the extraordinary Latin rite, extraordinary form, and the ordinary form of the Latin rite. So I, I can appreciate the different contributions each of these liturgies offer. There's no one liturgy that's the best. I can't say that because they're all great in their own right. One is more reverent in certain ways than another. Another is more charismatic. The good thing about the Latin Mass, now that we're on the subject, are all the things I mentioned. But again, they don't have the participation of the blood of Christ. Nobody receives the precious blood. And again, I'm not diminishing the doctrine of concomitance that teaches that whether you receive the body or blood, you receive the whole Christ. And yet, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus says in John 6, 53, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life. And the general instruction on the Roman Missal today, Article 240, states that communion is most clearly signified when it's given under both species. Now, this can be done by intinction. In the East, they use a spoon. They, they dip the bread into the blood with a spoon and administer it in the mouth of the recipient. Or by the priest or an extraordinary minister delegated by him to administer reverently the chalice. Um, so let us remember that the gift of living in the divine will is the fruit of, of the liturgy. It's the fruit of Louise's yes, her fiat to God. It is the fruit of Jesus and Mary's fiat. It is the fruit of Adam and Eve's fiat before sin. And it is also in eternity, the fruit of our fiat. Because God gave this gift while conceiving in his mind before the world existed, all those souls who would live in his will. And by virtue of them who did not yet exist in time, he imparted this gift to mankind, knowing that it would not, be go, would not go to waste, that those souls on earth that would exist would avail themselves of it in such a way that he and all creation would be more glorified than if there had been no sin. And this is known as Felix culpa, happy fault. For with sin came the Savior, Christ would not have become a savior had there been no sin. He would have become a king. And with the saviorship of Christ, there was the shedding of his blood, the exercise of the virtues, that elevated human nature to a higher state of glory than it would have enjoyed had there been no sin. So in virtue of us, our fiat, Mary's fiat, Jesus' fiat, Adam and Eve's fiat, Louise's fiat, this gift is given to us. And may God bless you and keep you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.